So I would number one to 33 on the Europe side on another sheet of paper label uh, bodies of water and um, nations and capitals here. You number it how you want. One to 50. States and capitals. Okay. What's wrong? Your mic on. Yes, thank you. The mic's on. Video's on. Everybody can hear me? So like the 26 and 27. Yeah. Oh, yeah, 27 is a body of water. 26 is a body of water. Okay. I didn't know they were like a and 33 is Africa. Okay, just Africa. Okay. Or, or, how about North Africa? Okay. Of North Africa, there is no capital. No, there is no capital. Africa is not. You got, you got Morocco. Algeria, Libya, and Egypt across the top. Tunisia as well. So um, don't worry about labeling. Just say Africa. Okay? And the one above it is Mediterranean Sea. Okay? All right? So when is that due? Next Monday? I don't know when we're having the test. I got to see how long it takes me to get through this. Wait, next week's Thanksgiving. I know. I don't think I'll finish by then. We'll see. The quiz on that won't be till I, Lily grades them and I hand them back. Oh, you're thinking that June. Oh. Sorry. Yeah, just to have the maps done, you got till next Monday. What do you think the quiz was going to come back? I was like, ooh. Look, you can label on the map, but listen, for everything you mislabel or fail to label, it's minus one. You get 25 for doing it correctly. So the moral of the story is don't mislabel or fail to label something. That's why I would do it on a separate sheet of paper, because otherwise, if you do it on the map, you're going to miss something. Don't be that guy that gets a 9 out of 25 on this. <laughs> The one where you can look at a map. Like, right. If you're looking at a Europe map, listen. Hey, write this down. Listen, pay attention. Bulgaria and Romania are not on this map. And if you're looking at a Europe map that has Yugoslavia on it, find a different one. Because <laughs> Yugoslavia no longer exists. It's been broken up into several countries. Why? U G O. And the Bulgaria and Romania. Romania are, they're not on this map. So what you're looking at may look like Romania or Bulgaria, but it's probably Hungary. So what like year is it like modern? Modern. Okay. Uh, Czech Czech Republic and Czechoslovakia are split. Should have two there, right? Number 20. Oh, no, it's not. Oh, got it. I copied a bad map. So 14 is just going to be Czechoslovakia. And it's actually split in two. And that's that's probably what went wrong here. Greece. Greece, we're not counting. It has no number. They're like, oh, they're there. But it's they're there. Not. I don't have a number on it. Do you want to add, add, add 34, Greece? Because there's no number. There's no number on it. Okay. Because it's only half of Greece. Uh, it's trying to help us. I mean, you kind of have There's hardly any of Africa. 28 is the Atlantic Ocean. I think there's a little there. Yeah, there is. Are we good? All right, I'm done with this map. Till next Monday. And this one you'll turn in in person. In person, okay? So we'll make you grade it. All right. I feel like the states and capitals are really so much easier. Really? All right, so we finished up with this slide. William Moffat, the birth of the modern Navy with the aircraft carrier, okay? This is going to be vital, especially in the Pacific. War, okay, it's going to be so vital. These carriers, all right. Now we move forward. Okay, I want you to look at this map. 
Now, I told you that story about what Churchill did to some of the French fleet, right? If you didn't see that video, you need to watch the video, okay? There's a lot of important information, and it's freaking interesting, so watch it. Look at this map. Now, Spain has fallen to the fascists under Ferdinand Franco, okay? You've got Italy, which is part of the axis with Germany. And then Switzerland, which will not be invaded. Okay. It's surrounded by mountains. The Swiss citizenry is among the most well armed citizenry in the world, if not the most well armed citizenry in the world. At this time. At this time and today. Who protects the Pope? Swiss Guard. Okay, now listen. The Swiss have a long history of militarism. It's just as far as um, their culture go dating back. Okay, um, it is it is believed that that's my family originates from Switzerland, the Hebrides. Okay, and so I've done some research on this, and um, a lot of the economy was really bad in the early uh, 18th century in Switzerland. And so they had a lot of people leaving, and some of them went to the New World, okay? And that's believed around 1740 is when um, my first ancestor came here, it was uh, from Swiss, a French-Swiss canton, okay? So some of these people that border France here, these cantons here, they, instead of states or provinces, they call them cantons. Uh, speak French. There are German Swiss cantons that border Germany and Italian Swiss cantons that border Italy, where they all they speak different languages. And there is a Swiss language, okay, which is where I've run into trouble tracing my family tree because their websites are all in Swiss and I can't read them. Okay. All right. Google Translate. They probably Yeah, mighty. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you don't want to invade there. I mean, it's just just the terrain is not conducive to fighting a war. Okay, so look at this. Who's got their back to the wall? The British, okay? And Hitler's next aim is to take them out, okay? Because what he wants to do is conquer the Western Front so he can focus on what he's always focused on, which is Lebensraum, living space in the East. He's already got half of Poland, okay? So the Soviet Union will come after they knock Britain out. It's just that the Brits are stubborn, and they're not going to let that happen. And neither will the leader Winston Churchill. And I played that, that video clip of Churchill's speech, uh, we will fight on the beaches. We will fight on the landing ground. And, in, in, and we'll continue the fight, even if the island or large part of it becomes subjugated by the Germans. We will continue the fight on the seas and through our empire, because the British have the Canada, India, okay, Australia, uh, South Africa, okay, New Zealand. The, the, they will continue the fight until in God's good time, Churchill says, in God's good time, the new world, with all its power and might, comes forth to the rescue and the liberation of the old world. Who's the new world? Until the United States gets involved, we will continue to fight. Okay, that's the message that has been driven into the British. There are many politicians in Britain that are ready to surrender, that are ready to create a peace deal with Hitler. Churchill takes a gamble and says, no, we're not going to do that. We're not going to become Nazi subjects. He's thinking about Western civilization. Now, guys, when you think about Western civilization, it's a, it's a lot like studying the Catholic Church, the history of the church. Okay, so the Romans, okay, and the spread of the Holy Roman Empire, Western civilization, the church as we know it is at risk. Christianity as we know it is at risk. Churchill realizes the importance of this moment. Now, if Britain can survive, This eye, uh, let's use this eye. Okay. Right, it's a little bit easier to see. 
If this island can survive, and one day the United States does get involved in this war, and Britain survives, we have a staging area 20 miles off the coast of continental Europe to bring millions of men, tens of thousands of tanks and aircraft, all the ammunition, all the fuel, all the food, all the medicine that we will need to launch a liberation of Europe. If they do not survive, the United States, if it got involved, would have to launch an invasion of Europe from across the Atlantic Ocean. Guys, if you know anything about D-Day, it was bad enough as it was just coming across the English Channel. Imagine trying to do that and stage that from across the Atlantic. So this is like a turning point in world history. You understand? If, if the British don't survive this, everything could be different. And that's why I'm going to spend some time on it. Okay? All right. So what we're about to see is the Battle of Britain. They stand alone against Hitler and Mussolini. Churchill inspires his people. Now, I'm going to talk about a movie. How many of you guys have ever seen the movie The King's Speech? I also watch Mary Kate Bell, both in the same class. Say that again? I, was, I saw The King's Speech and Mary Kate Bell. Both oh, man. oh, okay. Like, what, Mr. Kenton? Uh, no, Mr. Rivard's her speech. And I saw both of them. Oh, that's awesome. Did you see it too, King's Speech? Guys, this movie's fabulous. Okay, it's about the King of England during this time period. Okay, Philip, right? Philip? James? James? Yeah, he's got a stutter. Yeah, he stutters. So it's, it's all about this. Because, look, the King of England can't give a speech on the radio because he stutters and he, he needs to inspire his people. Okay, now just the fact that the royal family, once the bombing starts, guys, the royal family could have left. They could have gone to Canada. They stayed. Churchill stayed in London the whole time. Okay, with the people. They did send some of the family jewels, if you will, over to Canada. Okay, and some of the gold reserves over to Canada. Okay, um, precious artwork and so forth. But they stayed. And the movie The King's Speech is just funny because the um, the experts at how to solve stuttering, they all tried to work with the king, you know what I mean, and help the king so he could speak to the people. And so they finally, they're at wit's end, and they hire this guy that has kind of some different ideas about how to get over stuttering. And I just saw a clip, you guys would appreciate this in the movie, uh, of a John Wayne movie. Do you guys know who John Wayne was? the Duke, and there's this little kid that stutters, and John Wayne, like, gets him all fired up at him, and so the, the kid starts cussing at John Wayne, <laughs> but not cuss words that we use, but cuss words back then that they used, you know, not as, you know, today, what he was saying, he'd be saying on TV today, but anyway, and the kid stops stuttering, that's the same thing, this guy has the king of England cussing up a storm and screaming to learn how to get over his stuttering. And it's just funny because, you know, the British are so prime and, you know, prim and proper, you know, and to see the king doing it, it's really fun. Uh, it's a great movie. And he gets through the speech. I mean, that's what the whole thing is about. It's pretty neat. Uh, but Churchill's giving speeches too. And then his daughter, the, the king's daughter is Queen Elizabeth, who's still queen today. Okay, so she lived through all this. Um, so they start sending bombers, okay? Remember I talked about the heavy bomber, the, the Yunkers 88. They start bombing, okay? And the goal at first is to take out the British what? What do they want to take out? So first thing you're going to take out is bombing a country. What do you want to destroy? Their Air Force. Okay, in this case, it's called the Royal Air Force. The British aren't stupid. They know this, so they started hiding their planes. If you go look back at video of World War II, you see British planes taking off of grass runways because they dispersed them in, in rural areas, hit them under trees, camouflaged, painted them, and, and so that the Germans couldn't take them out. 
Okay. And uh, so they're prepared in that sense. In fact, they're well prepared for this. Okay. So this bombing starts what the British refer to as the Blitz. Okay. In the summer and fall of 1940. He's trying to bomb them into surrender. Okay. There's 48 million people on the island of Britain. Okay. Every single one of them is going to be affected. We already talked about the kids. Three million children being sent from the cities to the countryside to the estates. So those rich people in the estates, they were affected too. They had to take in all these kids. All right. Ladies, your age, 17, 18 years old. There's a myriad of things you're going to be doing. But the guys your age are all doing what? They're all being drafted in into the military. Okay. So the women have to replace the men in many places. And one of those places is on the farm. The old men that are too old to fight need help on the farm. So young, strong women like yourselves are going to go work on the farms. Okay? You're going to be placed into uh, some type of military service as well. Uh, there's a lot of different areas. Some of you will be taking care of these children that are in the countryside. Okay, but women will be all, everybody will be pressed into service. Okay, uh, women in the cities will go into the factories and work in the factories for sure. Okay, uh, so it just really, the whole country is dispersed in different ways. Okay, so let's talk about the air war first. Okay, now the British are prepared for this. They have a coast, you know, 20 miles to 60 to 80 miles separating them from the French coast. The, the Germans have built airstrips along the French coast so they can send their bombers out, okay, against across the channel, all right? Now, these are German aircraft lo losses for six-month periods throughout the war, okay? This is the year we're looking at, 1940. Now, one thing you have to remember, the Germans, like everybody else, is continually making planes throughout the war. It's not like you start the war with this many planes and you end the war with how many were destroyed. You're still building, replacing ones that are destroyed. Yes? Okay. So, in this six-month period, Germany lost 2,572 planes to combat losses, which is 71.4% of the entire Luftwaffe. So, they started sending these planes across the channel. A lot of them weren't coming home because the British were ready. Okay, the first thing the British had was Churchill. Okay, before I go to what the British had, this in England means this. Okay. It goes back to the days of archers. And you use these two fingers to fire an arch. Well, when that British would capture the French archers, because they were usually fighting the French or the Scots, they would cut off these two fingers. So they couldn't use the arch, the bow and arrow. Okay. Now, this means victory. This means peace. V is victory. That's what he's doing. He's not flipping them. Oh, no. <laughs> do, they, do they still do that today? You no, know, it's offensive there. I mean, so like if you did if you did that to someone, what would well, I don't know if the British would know what that meant. Okay. But they know what this means. You have to do it with your fingers too. No, this, 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 this means this. This means peace. I always do peace like this. <laughs> this really? Is, yeah. Yeah. I don't like. I, guess that's that's like that. I saw somewhere where it's like yeah, hackers can find yeah. your fingerprint. This so. is what people have to try this in the show. Okay. This is one of the things the British have. This, ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce you to the British Supermarine Spitfire. Okay, also pictured in the top left hand corner up there. Okay. This plane was developed by an aeronautical engineer named R.A. Mitchell. Okay. Now, back during between the wars, they used to have races every year to see who could build the fastest plane. 
in the world. And if you won that race, you won $25,000, okay? And R.A. Mitchell had this woman that was this really, really wit rich widow. And she, like, invested in him. She's like, we're going to win this race. And she invested, like, $100,000 with him. And he built the early models of this. Now, these race planes were all built on pontoons, so they would take off the water and land on the water, okay? And Mitchell won this race, like, three years in a row using this design. Now, what's unique about this aircraft are a couple different things. But first, you'll notice the wing. Okay, this has an elliptical wing. Now, when you're trying to mass produce something in a factory, making curves like this is more expensive and it takes more time. So if you look at most World War II fighters, they come with a box wing like or straight edges. Okay, when they got this thing in the sky with a 1,000 horsepower Rolls-Royce Merlin engine, this thing could not only fly fast, but it could maneuver at high speeds and high altitudes. Okay, the, the air is thinner the higher you go, yes? So these wings, they work, okay? And let me just give you an example. When this thing was going south for the Germans and so many of their planes were being shot down, the head of the Luftwaffe, Hermann Goering, said to his best fighter pilot, says, how do we beat these guys? And he said, give me a squadron of Spitfires, and we'll defeat the British. So they need British. Yeah, these planes. Because the, and now trust me, guys, the German fighter pilots have a hell of a lot more of experience than the British fighter pilots. Because they've been fighting in the Spanish Civil War, right? In Poland, you know, they, they've been fighting. They have a lot of experience. And you can discount that experience. It takes a lot of hours in a plane to be able to go into a dogfight against somebody else. I mean, we're talking hundreds and hundreds of hours of practice, okay? So this plane uh, also has uh, four machine guns in each wing. Now, if you can imagine trying to fly in a plane and fire your gun and trying to hit another moving plane, the more firepower you have and the more bullets you got coming out of your plane, the better chance you have of shooting somebody down, okay? So this plane and the men that flew it, which were not just British, British didn't have enough pilots. So you had free French, you had free Poles, and even free Czech pilots that were flying for the RF, and you had a few Americans, civilians flying with the RF. In fact, the first American to die in World War II was an American civilian flying for the RAF. Now, it was against the law for Americans to come over and fight. So what these pilots did, and there were quite a few, these are like mail delivery guys that fly planes. Uh, these are crop dusters that fly planes, stunt pilots, because that was big back in the 20s. And they went to Canada, and they got fake Canadian citizenship, fake papers and posed as Canadians, went over to Britain and flew for the RAF and the Royal Air Force. One of them was really famous. He was actually an Olympus, Olympic, Olympic, excuse me, gold medalist in the 1938 Winter Olympics. It was 36, 38. They used to do them all the same year, didn't they? The Winter and Summer Olympics at the same time, the same year. Anyhow. He was a bobsled, won the gold, and he was also a pilot. He died. Right. It's a great story. There's a book called uh, The Few by Alex Kershaw that talks about these Americans that went over the fly. Okay. Too much information? Sure. But that's okay. Now, and you guys see there's some video stuff too. We've got to get to that. Now, here's a key fact. Okay. Radar. Radio, detecting, and ranging. Radar. 
This was invented by the British and by the Germans and by the Japanese all about the same time. Guys, and I, I think I've said this before, guys, when there's a war on and it's about survival, people figure out a way, you know, to try and survive. Okay, and radar is a direct um, response to that. Okay, and radar is still saving lives today, right? When we talk about tornadoes, you know, when they see it on the, they can actually see a tornado on the radar. Okay, it's saving lives. Now, radar allows the British to know when the Germans are coming with their bombers. It allows them to know what direction their bombers are headed. It doesn't allow them to know the altitude quite yet. So they have people on the coast, spotters, radioing the altitude of the planes, how many planes there are, okay, so that they can prepare. Now remember how I told you they dispersed the RAF into the countryside hiding their planes? So as soon as the radar picked up the Germans coming across the Atlantic, you guys know sound moves across water better than it does across land, right? Because there's nothing to block it. Okay, so they pick up this radar as soon as they're leaving France. And they get these planes. This is the Spitfire. They also have a very good other fighter plane called the Hawker Hurricane. And these pilots will be sitting around in these rural areas at a grass airstrips in a, in a small building drinking beer, a pint, if you will, okay? And then the radio will come in, and they will ring a bell for all the pilots to get in their planes and get up in the sky. So by the time the Germans reached the English coast, they were already in the air, okay? and started shooting down the bombers. So the Germans would send fighters along the way with their bombers to shoot down these planes. You follow me? And the British are gonna have a lot of aircraft losses as well, a lot. Okay, this is an air war. So because so many British pilots were getting shot down too, they were telling them to eject from the aircraft. Rather than try and save the plane, they can build a plane faster than they can train a pilot. So just ditch it. If you think you're going down, ditch it. Parachute. We'll come get you. Okay, there were times, guys, where German, or excuse me, RAF pilots were shot down over the English Channel, parachuted out, were picked up by a boat, and back in the air the same day. This worked, okay? So the Germans started bombing at night, okay? First they went after the airfields, which they destroyed, but there were no planes there. And that wasn't working. And so they changed their tactics, started bombing at night, and then they started bombing the cities. London, Liverpool, Manchester trying to destroy the will of the British to fight. And that's the importance of things like Churchill, trying to keep them around. Guys, this is going to last six months. There will be periods where like 28 straight days, London is bombed. Okay? At night, causing fires. Okay? Destroying buildings. Okay? But this... And these pilots will change the course of human history. Churchill said this of the RAF and the pilots. He said this, never in the course of human conflict have so many owed so much to so few. Say it one more time. Never in the course of human conflict have so many owed so much to so few the pilots of the RAF, okay? Because if they don't win this air war, this operation to invade Britain, if the Germans control the skies, 
they invade. If they don't control the skies, they can invade. Yeah? So here's Norway up here. You got Denmark and then the French coast. And these are different ways that the Germans flew and attacked the island. Okay? So most of these attacks are coming from the French coast, but they did attack from Norway and from Denmark as well with bombers. Okay, and this is just an artist's depiction of a dogfight between a German Messerschmitt and a Supermarine Spitfire. Okay, and then I have a video. Someone. I, I actually pulled it up before class, so I'll get ready. Okay. Now, I hope YouTube doesn't stop me on this one. Stop. Anything happened yet? Okay, what's kind of crazy, guys, is that that summer, and Britain is notorious for bad weather, like rainy weather and stuff like that. But that summer, um, much of the much of the time, it was clear sky. So if you were living in southern England, and you just look up every day and you see this going on above the skies of England, you know what I mean? Um, now this other video, many of you have seen this before. But this shows the bombing of London. And I bet YouTube gets me on this one. So the Junkers 88, the German bombers. See the spotlights? Talk about that. anti-aircraft fire shooting at the plane.
the top. Some of you have seen that movie, right? Most of you. Okay. So, um, just some pictures here with, with some explanation, okay? Uh, there's that full picture of Churchill with the uh, Tommy gun there. Um, if you go to uh, London today, uh, they have what's called the Imperial War Rooms. And it's where Churchill stayed during the bombing. Okay, uh, it's very inconspicuous. It's, it's like a row of apartments, and then there's a park. You go down to the end of the row of apartments, and there's uh, some staircase that go underground. And the day the war ended, they left the room exactly as it was. So if you go to this museum, it's a museum now, you can see exactly as it was when the war ended. So you have the map room. You can see the bed that Churchill slept in, which was in the map room. <laughs> He liked to stay up really late. Uh, he liked to drink, smoke cigars. Um, there's a lot of funny stories about Churchill. But um, and then the next day, you guys smell that? Yeah. This is chemistry people. Okay, we'll, we'll get out if we have to. Um, he's down amongst the people. Okay, and they're having to pull people out of this rubble. That's why you die if you turn the car on the road. Carbon monoxide. Yeah. It makes me think of candles. Like, how can you blow them out? Yeah, but then it's so smart. Everybody got a match? Yeah. <laughs> it's going to be all right. I trust <laughs> folk land. <laughs> okay. Uh, this is part of that quote from Churchill. Never was so much owed by so many to so few. Okay. And then you'd see these children here, okay? Um, guys, think about the three million kids that went off. They went off at the beginning of the phony war. So they were there for six months before the bombing even started, or before the Battle of Britain even started. And so some of the kids started coming back to the cities, and their parents were gone. I mean, mom was off working in some factory somewhere. Dad was in the Army. He was probably over in France. So you had these bands of kids running around, uh, with no parents and okay, little hooligans okay and uh there's some funny stories reading about there's bands of like seven eight nine year old kids just terrorizing neighborhoods okay um yeah so the you know the king and the queen or the king and churchill were there uh the royal family stayed this is for morale purposes to know that he is there with them okay going through this because guys it's easy after months and months of bombing, to just say, I've had enough. I can't, we can't do this anymore. Okay, so that type of morale is important. All right. Uh, next slide. Okay. So I wrote a paper a while back, uh, actually in 2005, for my graduate class uh, called Citizen fortress britain citizen survival tactics and home defensive measures during the battle of britain okay 13 pages a minus i got a 93 okay now these are called barrage balloons am i almost out of time okay. oh, wow. two minutes okay uh let me i'll talk about barrage balloons in the next lecture but i'll talk about this this shelter here because we just saw it in the film, okay? Uh, when the, the Chronicles of Narnia, when they're running into the backyard, they're getting out of the house, okay? The, the British government provided these to anybody that wanted one. They're called Anderson Shelters. And you dig a hole in your backyard about three feet deep, and then you get this corrugated metal you bolt it together at the top. Now, these you could make these as nice as you wanted. They're a shelter. Um, and the one in the movie looked pretty nice. I mean, it looked like they had carpet down. Uh, most people didn't have carpet down. They would just go there during an air raid because you don't want to be in your house during an air raid because if the house gets hit, it falls on you and chances are you're going to die. So you go to the backyard, you're underground a little bit, you got the steel around. Okay. Um, so generally, for most people, these things, when it rained, they would fill up with mud. If you had food stored in there, you'd get rodents, 
rats and stuff like that, stray cats hanging out in your shelter, okay? Now, if you go to London today, you'll still see these in people's backyards from the, the time of the war, usually with a garden around it or something like that, okay? So those are Anderson shelters. Um, fire was a big problem uh, with the bombing of the city. So obviously, uh, the Germans were pretty harsh here. What they would do is they would try and bomb during low tide so that the Thames River was low and um, making it harder to draw water to put out fires, okay? Um, but they, they did. They, you know, had fire crews of people that would, would that was their job. Um, and then I'll talk about these balloons, uh, which are kind of crazy uh, and interesting at the same time. And then I've got some really other, I mean, the British are going to go primitive here I mean, for their survival. And it's, it's pretty interesting how this goes out. Now, in reality, it was the air war that won it, but the survival tactics are interesting to study. Okay? All right. You guys have a good one. Thanks for coming.